It's an external interference factor. And that's the most important one, and that's the one we have been studying. The third effect is delayed. In other words, the most common long-range uh, defect that goes on before birth and after birth and e even in the next generation are particularly chromosome alterations. We need to have an, a balanced chromosome in order to produce balanced children. And that's the major long-term damage of radiation. If the chromosomes are in an egg or a sperm, you have a hereditary chromosome problem. Mm. If it is in a tissue, like the breast or, or the gut or whatever, you have a carcinoma of the breast or colon or whatever have you. So the whole spectrum is true. But what we have focused on are essentially teratogenic, that is, congenital malformations due to the interference of radiation with a normal development. Yes. So I'd like you to explain. I've, I've got a list of the abnormalities that you uh, describe in your paper. Uh, I'll Correct. just read them through. Conjoint twins, teratomas, microcephaly, neural t tube defects, anophthalmia, microphthalmia, disruption of blastogenesis, and cephalus seals, uh, I don't know what that is, and anencephaly. Would you like, Dr. Wojtelecki, to explain, please, to the audience, um, as we're two pediatricians talking together using our medical terminology, what these, what these terminologies actually mean? Well, interference by a teratogen or, a, or an agent that produces malformations varies at, uh, based on the time of its impact. So when a child is conceived and, uh, and an egg is fertilized, for the first uh, 16 or so cell divisions, every, the machine works only on the mother's genome or uses the genes of the mother. Uh, the cell divides and divides and divides and divides, but doesn't grow in size. It, it, the sperm has to unfold and contribute the other half of the genes coming from the father before it becomes a true parasite, before it can start feeding itself and increasing in volume at extraordinary speed. The, num the universe from conception to birth in terms of cell division is infinitely larger than all the cell divisions from birth to death that follow. Mm. So really, the development of an embryo is explosive. Mm. Now, there are two parts of the developmental sequence. One is before implantation. That is, before the egg reaches the uterus and is able to become essentially a cancerous-like tumor. In other words, it it sticks into the wall, it begins to disintegrate the wall, makes it bleed, it begins to eat that blood, it develops its own circulation, and so on and so on. These malformations we're talking about are essentially before implantation. Oh, really? Before a woman, before a woman even knows she's pregnant. Oh. So in other words, they are very early, and the first one, of course, is you lay, first of all, a line or an axis. This is going to be top or head. This is going to be tail or bottom. This is going to be right or left and front and back. And this is when you have one axis. Well, sometimes that axis splits and you get twins. Uh -huh. And we know that one out of 70 babies is a twin. Every twin that is monozygotic, meaning coming from one egg, is a malformation. It's an anomaly. Oh. Normally, we are not two. Normally, we are one. And sometimes the split is incomplete, so they remain stuck. And so that's what pagus means. Pagus means stuck in Greek. So they get stuck chest to chest or belly to belly or head to head. And they live what is called forever together, if they live. So that's what we get. The characteristic of these anomalies, if they survive, 
is they don't have mental retardation and many other things that are so common among other congenital malformed babies. If they survive, the brain will develop because the potential of development of the rest of the organism remains intact. This is interference, not abnormal genes. So the genes of whatever else goes on are capable of normal development. You know, five fingers here, five there. Both twins, and as you know, many Siamese twins are intelligent and <clears throat> articulate. Now, a little bit down the line, if you now have one axis and you want to be become a human being, this little flat plate, like a saucer, has to make a tube. Because everything in biology, we are all a bunch of tubes. So it begins to fold and has an opening on the top and one opening at the bottom, and this is the top of the tube, will be the head, and the bottom two will be the end of the spinal cord, and all in between is that neural axis, head, and spine. If that tube does not close, you get opening. So on the top, you will miss the head, so that's called anencephaly. A little bit further down, doesn't close, it's like a zipper, doesn't zip, you will have a spina bifida or open spine. And then there are all kinds of technical terms to distinguish variabilities of these. Now, on the other hand, if you have the other side forward, if it doesn't close, your belly doesn't close, so at least it's an umbilical hernia, very common around the umbilical cord. A bigger one is called a phallocele or, you know, an opening in the front. Omphalon is, is actually a belly button and so on. So you have what's called body wall defects. In fact, the non-closure of the neural tube and the non-closure of the belly or abdomen are correlated. That is, the risk of having both is far greater for those who have one or the other. Oh, fancy. Than somebody who would have only one or the other. So we have that too. We have about 15% uh, of babies, if they have one, they have the other as well. Now, <clears throat> if you have that non-closure a little bit higher, the heart, the heart is outside of the chest. And it will be beating uh, unprotected. And some babies, perfectly normal, intelligent babies going to school, happen to have this very serious congenital malformation of an open chest with the heart palpating there. So we know that the brain is spared, so the genes are normal because you cannot have a normal brain and a normal intelligence unless virtually all your genes are working. Mm. The machinery of the brain is so complicated that if you have a genetic imbalance, your chances to have normal intelligence are close to nil. So you can almost say that babies with serious congenital malformations who have normal intelligence are not due to genetic mutation. For example, spina bifida. You have a lot of intelligent people in, in wheelchairs, paralyzed, that there is nothing wrong with their intellect. And to postulate that these anomalies are due to genes is silly. But they are due to something. Um, except that your postulate that they've got normal genes, I don't quite understand because children with cystic fibrosis have two abnormal genes and they've got normal intelligence or children with diabetes or children with... But those are not teratogenic. Genes. No, they're not teratogenic, yes, yes. Yeah. Well, would now, you... There are genes that cause malformations, of course. Mm. Cleft lip and palate is an example. Okay. So we know that cleft lip and palate is more common in families. We know it's more common in certain ethnic groups. But we also know there are drugs that cause cleft lip and palate. Mm. And so, on. so life is not a one explanation fit all. Yes. Nor one anomaly has one explanation. But all the evidence in this region, the northern region, of 
where we study shows that the anomalies are not due to alcohol. Radiation is everywhere, so why should we seek causes somewhere, you know, in, in New Zealand? Of course. Yeah, it right in front of our nose, a major cause of congenital malformation called radiation. Yeah. So obviously we're going to focus on that. And the way you do this is, for instance, we measure head size. Every baby born has a head measurement. This is routine medicine. And the head measurement should be within standards. And we find that in some areas it's below standards. So these are called subclinical impacts. Those babies have not microcephaly or cephaly because those heads are not that small, but they are smaller. And similar effects have been noticed in Sweden and in Norway in, in the only in the areas impacted by Chernobyl mm. about 20 years ago. And their IQs so, are lower. Exactly. So, you know, microcephaly is an anomaly late. It, uh, it is far further down the development uh, time timeline. And that's why if you impact the brain, you impact the intelligence. Would but you, you like have to, to have a brain. Mm -hmm. Yes. Would you like to describe what a teratoma is, what a microphthalmia is, and anophthalmia to the audience, please? Okay, sure. Sure. Well, the brain is, a, is, as I said, first there is a tube, and then the tube closes. It becomes a balloon uh, with a communication going downward toward the spine. So this balloon... Uh, you know, then splits into two balloons, and we have the right brain and the left brain. Now, from that balloon, puts us out, or there is a second balloon that comes out, and that's the eye. The eye really is an extension of the brain. That's why the retina, the, the, the visual aspect of the eye, uh, is nervous tissue. Now, if you have microcephaly, you are more likely to have microphthalmia. Those two are very often uh, a package. So you have to study both at the same time, and we see uh, statistically significant higher rates of both, of microphthalmia and microcephaly. But those are later teratogenic effects than, let's say, uh, the congenital twin. Now, the other anomaly, teratoma, we have to backtrack to that axis. If you have an axis and you make two, you have twins. If they don't separate, you have conjoint twins. But if they don't separate and one becomes degenerate, incorporated, altered, he begins to look like a lump. And instead of dying, he is parasitizing uh, the normal organism. And so these children are born with a tumor. We call it a tumor, which is nothing but a lump. And in that lump, there is every tissue of, of the human organism. You find teeth and hair and fingers or whatever have you, but it's completely deranged. And those are called teratomas or, or, or monster-like uh, non uh, or monster-like things that didn't become, uh, they, they don't look like a human, okay? That's what a teratoma is. And they are usually located in the sacrum area, lumbosacral area, or the coccyx, and so on and so on. So obviously that is of interest to us because it may be a package. You have twins on one side, conjoined twins, and then... Uh, a, a different degree of the same thing called teratoma. Mm. So now you've produced this paper. There's statistical evidence that the food is very radioactive in this area. And in fact, you say that one mushroom eaten in the affected area may deliver as much radiation as hundreds of chest X-rays. Or more. Uh, well, one one mushroom has as much radioactivity as, let's say, four or five pounds of wood. Uh, different organisms, different trees, 
uh, different nutrients are different products. The 